Okay, good evening. Sorry for the late recording because uh, during daytime it was still very noisy due to the drilling up to 6 o'clock. So anyway, let's uh, tackle uh, problem 2. But uh, as stated in pro problem 2, we will be using the same data as in problem 1. Only that in problem 2, the equity method is used. Uh, in problem 1, the cost model uh, is used. So take note that we have the same uh, data in the problem. The only difference here lies on the uh, entries in uh, recording uh, uh, investment to be uh, finally closed and uh, in recording uh, share of the parent in the subsidiary's net income and uh, as well as in the dividends uh, given by the subsidiary. So anyway, since uh, most of the solutions are uh, the same with uh, the cost uh, model, now don't uh, worry if I'll uh, go a little bit uh, faster because uh, the figures uh, shown in the answers are mostly uh, the same. So I will just try to highlight uh, whatever difference between the cost model and the equity model. So in uh, requirement number one, determine the following items for January 1, 20x4 uh, for the consolidated retained earnings non-controlling interest and consolidated stockholders equity so for uh, the retained earnings uh, consolidated retained earnings it's uh, the retained earnings balance of the parent as of the date of acquisition so it's uh, 360,000 as uh, given in the original part of uh, problem one then second we have the NCI partial full so for uh, the partial it's uh, 90,000 or 20 percent of the fair value of the stockholders equity of the subsidiary while for uh, full goodwill it's still 93,000 uh, just like that in uh, problem number one then for determining the uh, adjustments to reflect fair value uh, finally we have the under valuation of assets and liabilities as uh, computed down for 90,000 so we still have a uh, similar uh, net under valuation just like that in problem uh, one meaning to say under the cost model and the equity uh, model the computations of the over or the under valuation are still the same so for inventory we have under valuation uh, land under valuation equipment under valuation uh, buildings over valuation and for bonds payable we have a difference of four thousand 800 which is your discount on bonds payable okay so we have now the net under valuation of assets and liabilities in the amount of 90,000 now we have the analysis of uh, the uh, building and equipment for as stated above so we have now the analysis and for the building, a negative figure of 24,000. Then a summary of depreciation and amortization adjustments for uh, we have now the equipment will be uh, depreciated more by 12,000 uh, because of the under valuation of 96,000. So we divide that by 8 years. So while for the building we have an uh, 
overvaluation in the amount of uh, 24,000 and it's only to be uh, amortized over a period of four years. That's why we have to deduct 6,000 uh, every year from the accumulated depreciation. And for bonds payable, we have the interest uh, expense to be debited and then we credit to discount on bonds payable. Still, we have the same uh, figures as in uh, problem number one. For 20x4, we have the uh, allocated excess here of 13,200 uh, arising from uh, adjustments and only 7,200 for 20x5. Then in letter C, we are asked for the consolidated stockholders uh, equity. So under the partial uh, goodwill approach, it's still a 1,050,000, whereas under the full goodwill approach, we have the amount of 1,050,000. Now, the following uh, items for December 31, 20X4 and 20X5 in the Consolidated Financial Statements. Now, we are advised to refer to Requirement 6 as a guide. However, I think it's not only to refer to Requirement 6, but also to Requirement number 5. Now, take note again that the figures are uh, similar as that in uh, problem number one, except for uh, very few accounts that uh, we are going to uh, specify later. So, we have now your uh, uh, alternative uh, solutions. You will notice that uh, we still have the same uh, solutions as in uh, problem number one we are just uh, copying no what are in problem number one for most of these uh, figures except that uh, we have the equity method as uh, distinguished from the cost model when it comes to the recording of the net income share of the parent from the subsidiary company and as well as in recording uh, dividends. Now we will uh, see uh, the differences in uh, requirement number five where we have the journal uh, entries before we move on to requirement number six. So as I have already told you, uh, though the advice is uh, to refer to requirement number 6 only, but uh, prior to requirement number 6, it's uh, uh, more uh, proper that we refer to requirement number 5 for the set of uh, journal entries that will finally guide you in uh, filling up the paper, the work paper, in uh, requirement number six because in uh, requirement number five uh, we have the journal entries and these journal entries will be uh, your uh, adjustments and eliminations that will be uh, noted down in uh, requirement number five now if we refer to uh, Actually, requirement uh, number three is uh, the journal entry to record the investment in the books of the acquirer uh, company. So again, with debit two, uh, I am now referring to requirement number three before I'll move on to requirements uh, five and six. On January 1, 2004, we now debit to investment in uh, S company for... 372,000 in credit to cash. Now take note that the entry is similar to the acquisition entry under the cost model. Now from January 1, 20X4 to December 31, 20X4, 
when uh, we now debit to cash and credit to investment in S company. Now we are uh, trying to uh, emphasize the use of the equity method. Whereas under the cost model, the entry made was to debit cash for uh, 28800 and to credit dividend income. Take note that this amount of dividends of uh, 36000 uh, in uh, the December 31, 20 X4 trial balance, you have the dividends paid under the column Sachs Company, meaning this was the dividends uh, paid by the subsidiary company. Now, the only difference between the cost model and the equity method is that under the cost model, when dividends are received, from the subsidiary company, debit to cash, and credit to dividend income. Whereas, in the use of the equity uh, method, the credit for the dividends uh, received is investment in a company or the investment account. Now, on December 31, 20 export, when... Uh, now we have uh, the subsidiary or S company reporting net income in the amount of uh, 60,000. 80% of it will go to the parent and 20% will go to the subsidiary. Now take note that the entry is to debit investment in as company and to credit investment income which was not uh, prepared in connection with the cost model in other words in the cost model when uh, the uh, net income of the subsidiary is uh, given the uh, parent has no entry but under under the cost model but under the equity method, the entry of the parent is to debit investment in S company and uh, to credit investment income. So there, uh, I would like to emphasize the differences between the cost model and the equity method in uh, terms of uh, recording dividends uh, received. Uh, by the parent from the subsidiary when the entry is to debit cash or debit to dividends receivable and credit to dividend uh, income under the cost model. But under the equity method, the credit is to investment in S company. Now, that's one difference. Then another difference is in uh, the recording of the uh, income or the net income reported by the subsidiary. So, under the cost model, there's no entry in the books of the parent. Uh, it's only a notation that the subsidiary earns net income of how much. But, under the equity method, the entry of the parent is to debit investment and to credit uh, debit investment in S company and to credit investment income. So it merely means that under the equity method, the investment account is debited for the original acquisition cost. It's debited for the net income uh, declared by the subsidiary. So, meaning uh, you have these two debits and the investment account is credited for the dividends received by the parent from the subsidiary. So, you debit to cash or dividends receivable and you credit to investment. So, it will reduce the investment account. In other words, the investment account will be increased for the original acquisition cost. It will be increased for the net income of 
the subsidiary, the share of the parent, but it will be decreased for the dividends uh, received from the subsidiary. And likewise, it will be decreased uh, when there is a net loss declared by the subsidiary. When you have to uh, debit your uh, investment loss or loss from investment and you credit to investment in S company. That's another example of uh, a transaction that will uh, reduce the investment account just like your uh, recording of the dividends uh, declared paid by the subsidiary company. So this time, uh, you will credit the investment account for the dividends uh, paid by the subsidiary and you also debit the investment account for uh, the net loss, uh, net loss share of the parent in the net loss okay so these are the uh, i think the uh, highlights of uh, problem number two is uh, more on uh, the journal entries that will uh, differentiate the cost model from the equity model now the rest of the other items appear to be similar so the last entry on December 31, 2004, now debit to investment income. And uh, uh, we have now for the goodwill impairment loss. And again, credit to investment in S company. Now, which is not uh, very open. It's not always uh, uh, a case, no? Because unlike your... Uh, your uh, giving of uh, dividends by the subsidiary and the possibility for a loss, net loss to be declared by the subsidiary when in both cases you have to credit the investment account. Now, but if there is uh, a goodwill impairment loss, then you also have to uh, debit investment income account and uh, credit to investment in S company. So we have now to record the amortization of allocated excess of inventory, equipment, buildings, and uh, you have bonds payable and goodwill impairment loss. Now, if you can uh, recall in the table above, since uh, problem number one was uh, discussed, the amount of 13,200 for 20x4 is already familiar. And uh, we multiply it by 80% because the parent owns only 80% of the uh, subsidiary's uh, stocks. No? Uh, we have subsidiary S. Then the uh, impairment loss of uh, 3,750, but 750 is uh, for the non-controlling interest. So that's why you have to uh, credit. Okay, so we now uh, debit investment uh, income. Uh, likewise, if there's net income, uh, declared by the subsidiary, you credit investment income, but you have to debit investment income for the share of the parent in the undervaluation of the assets and liabilities and also in the goodwill impairment loss. Now, the investment balance and investment income in the books of uh, P company is as follows. So, in other words, uh, uh, we have to highlight this uh, being the main uh, distinction between the cost model and the equity model. So, we have now the investment in uh, S company uh, initially for the 
acquisition cost. We are debiting the investment for 372,000. Another debit is for the share of the parent in the net income of the subsidiary. We are crediting the investment account for the share of the parent in the dividends uh, declared and paid by the subsidiary and likewise credit the investment account for the amortization of the allocated uh, undervaluation and as well as for the impairment loss. Now take note that the amortization of the allocated excess or the undervaluation uh, in 20x5 is 7,200. It's in uh, 20x4 where you have 13,200 because of your inventory. So likewise, the investment income account for uh, the net income of the subsidiary the entry of the parent is uh, to credit investment income by 48000 and debit the account for the amortization of the allocated excess and the impairment loss. So you have now the uh, balance, uh, the balances of the investment uh, account. Now, if you can recall under the cost model, the balance of the investment account is uh, just 372000 So, in other words, it's uh, the investment in uh, S uh, account is not affected by a net income of the uh, subsidiary, not affected by amortization uh, and impairment loss, and even by dividend so the amount remaining in investment account is still the original acquisition cost okay so and also we have the schedule of uh, determination and allocation of uh, allocated excess where we have now under the partial goodwill we have the uh, positive excess uh, equal to 12,000 if you can recall, we have the same amount under uh, the cost model. Now we have the over or the under valuation for the amount of 90,000. These figures were also found in uh, problem number one. And even with this, uh, 13,200 and 7,200. And under the uh, full goodwill, uh, the excess of cost over the fair value is uh, 15,000 uh, based on this uh, computations. Like uh, while under the partial goodwill approach, it's 12,000. Now, for the consolidation work paper, this is uh, what I was uh, uh, telling you that uh, we have uh, E1 uh, to the entry uh, to close the common stock uh, account of the subsidiary. Uh, this where the balance is as of uh, the acquisition date. So we now debit common stock, debit to retained earnings, and credit to non-controlling interest equal to 360 thousand multiplied by 20 percent so the balance of 80 percent goes to the parent then entry number two is uh, still to debit the uh, undervaluation of the inventory then uh, the equipment and uh, we have the building uh, here as uh, the computations are stated above then we have land also undervalued and uh, discount on bonds payable for the uh, uh, difference between the uh, principal amount of uh, the bonds and the 
the fair value given. So there, this actually is discount on bonds payable. Now we have to record goodwill as computed above in the amount of 12000 Now credit to buildings, uh, all of these figures are given above. And the non-controlling interest of uh, 18000 uh, uh, based on 90000 uh, we have 20%, uh, uh, so 90,000 is uh, also given above for the non-controlling interest, uh, 90,000 times 20%, so only 18,000, and the investment in S company for 84,000, so that makes uh, 200. 88,000 and uh, 84 total of 372,000 to eliminate the original uh, acquisition cost. Then also we adjust for cost of goods sold uh, rising from the undervaluation of the inventory, depreciation expense, then accumulated depreciation of buildings, interest expense or uh, uh, the uh, amortization of the discount on bonds uh, payable. Then we have the goodwill impairment loss of 3000 uh, Here we credit back the inventory uh, for 6000 and uh, we have the accumulated depreciation of equipment. Now we are crediting back inventory because we are charging cost of goods sold for 6000 We credit to discount on bonds payable. That's the amortization debited to interest expense and credit now for goodwill. Charge to goodwill impairment loss. Here we have the figures shown also in uh, problem number one. It should be observed that the goodwill computed above was proportional to the controlling interest of 80% and the non-controlling interest of 20% computed as follows. So we have now the total uh, goodwill, full goodwill, uh, equal to 15,000. So again, the goodwill impairment loss of 3,000. 750 based on 100% fair value of full goodwill uh, would be allocated as follows. Okay, so the next entries now in E4 we debit to investment na income for 34, 440, then uh, debit to non controlling interest 7,200. Uh, and then we have to uh, credit dividends paid 36,000 uh, and investment in S company in the amount of 5,640 to eliminate intercompany dividends and investment income under the equity method and establish share of dividends computed as follows. Now you will notice that above. Uh, we have the uh, balancing or the balance in the T account. We have the balance of investment uh, income as uh, this is the difference between uh, the net income uh, share of the parent and uh, the allocation of the excess at uh, 34, 440. Now we have the uh, Additional credit investment in uh, S company here. Actually, this was already uh, uh, stated above. So, investment in uh, S company for uh, the net income of 48,000 and dividend, and uh, we have 28,800 and the amortization and impairment of 13,000 
560. Now you will notice in the previous entry that we have already credited investment uh, in S for 288,000 and as well as credited investment in S for 84,000. Meaning, uh, the total uh, debit of uh, 372,000 upon acquisition was finally credited to the investment account for 372,000 is already finally closed. Now, but since under the equity method, we still debit to investment uh, in S for the share of the parent in the net income of S, and we have to credit investment in S for uh, the share of the parent in the dividends given by the subsidiary and uh, for 13,000. 560 for the impairment loss and we have uh, goodwill no uh, impairment uh, and including the allocation or the amortization of excess now take note again that the investment income account was debited for the amortization uh, of the excess and the impairment of goodwill uh, or the loss, so that was debited for thirteen five sixty and credited investment income for uh, the amount of forty eight thousand share of the parent in the net income. That's why we are now debiting investment income. Uh, we are debiting because normally investment income is a credit. So, we are debiting in order to close the account. Okay, so this is uh, one main difference between the cost model and the equity method. Uh, actually, in the cost model, uh, we have no investment income account. It's only under the equity method where the parent records its share in the net income of the uh, subsidiary and as well as the uh, amortization of the allocated excess and the uh, uh, impairment of uh, loss of goodwill. So we are now debiting investment income for 34, 440 and debit to non-controlling interest for uh, each share in the a dividends uh, given for 36,000 uh, credit to dividends paid and now we are crediting investment in S company uh, excluding the original acquisition cost because uh, that was already closed in the entries above so now we are Closing investment in S company for 5,640. The fact that the debit side uh, amount is 48,000 and uh, we have now the credit of uh, 28,000 and 13, 28,813, 560. That makes 42,300. Uh, 60 deducted from 48,000. So we are finally closing investment in S company. Now take note again that this entry is uh, very important but only under the equity method. Okay, so that's uh, E4. And after the eliminating entries are posted in the investment account. It should be observed that from consolidation point of view, the investment account is totally eliminated. So, if you have now the investment account, I uh, eliminated 372,000 above. We have the credit to 288,000 in E1 and 84,000 in E2. Then in... Uh, 
before we are crediting 5,640. So that makes now a uh, total of the debits and the credits. So the investment uh, account, investment in as company is already closed. Then in E5, we have now the non-controlling interest in net income of subsidiary in the amount of uh, 9360 that's 20% of the net income after the amortization of the allocated excess. Okay? So, I think uh, requirement number five, the adjustments and the elimination entries are very, very important in arriving at the answers in the worksheet. And, uh, of course, that will guide you in answering uh, the blanks in requirement number two. So, here we have... Uh, sales and uh, now P company and we have investment uh, income as uh, the balance of the investment income account and we have eliminated. Now uh, take note that if you are familiar with the entries in uh, requirement number 5, now the entries in requirement number 5 are the ones uh, posted in your debit and credit sides of the work paper. So in other words, you're here and you have the totals approving uh, the equality of uh, the debits and the credits. So if you have now the total assets of uh, the parent, uh, we have also the its total uh, liabilities, contra asset accounts, and stockholders equity. Now, uh, take note that uh, the parent now is uh, the column, the first column is that of the parent. And uh, I'd like to emphasize the fact that the adjustments and eliminations are being followed, uh, posted here but your reference is if, uh, requirement number five. That's how important requirement number five is. Uh, if you have uh, E1, so that means debit uh, as company uh, retained earnings. Then you have to debit uh, as company uh, common stock. Okay, as company... Uh, common stock, you have to cred credit 240,000 here. Actually, debit, not credit. So, debit common stock, number one, 240,000. Still, number one, we have to debit retained earnings. That's number one. And uh, still, part of number one is finally two. Okay, we have 72,000 uh, uh, being the non-controlling interest and we have investment in as company. Uh, we have the uh, entries in uh, E1. Okay, I'll uh, try to uh, uh, share screen again the entries in E1. So you can see how these uh, entries were uh, posted in the work paper. So if uh, you have these entries in requirement number 5, uh, you just post them in the work paper. So here, oh, so we have now E1, debit to common stock, 240000 a debit to retained earnings, 120000 Credit to investment in S company, 288000 And credit non-controlling interest for 72000 So let's repeat E1, 240, 
and then credit 288 and 72. While in E2, you are now uh, debiting the total of uh, debit to inventory, accumulated depreciation, uh, another accumulated uh, depreciation, then uh, we have to uh, debit land and uh, as well as uh, goodwill for another 12,000. So that makes a total uh, debit of 318,000. No? 318. That makes uh, 102, 192, 12,000 and 12,000. Uh, Actually, we have a uh, total of 318,000. That's total of the debit side. The total of the credit side in E2 is uh, 216,000 and uh, 100. 2,000. So, that makes total of 318,000 in E2. Uh, again, I'd like to emphasize that your debit should tally with the credit. Now, for E3, uh, the debits in uh, E3, 6, uh, that makes uh, 18,000 plus 4, 200. We have 22. 200 for the total of the debits then the credits we have total of 22 uh, 200 okay then for e4 uh e4 now we have uh, the uh, total of the debit investment income and uh, uh, we have uh, non-controlling interest the total is 41, 640, the same with the credits. Then uh, for E5, uh, E5 here, we have the uh, debit of uh, 9360 and the credit of 9360. So I think we have to make corrections uh, in the numbering. Uh, in the numbering of... Uh, number one so for the debit of a uh, number one and uh, the credit no uh, the credit is uh, 288,000 and we have uh, 84 so take note 288,000 is uh, number one and uh, 84,000 is number one. Okay, number one, gya po na ang 288 ang 84. So the total is 372,000. That's the total, okay? So you try to uh, post whatever are found in uh, E1. We are posting this to the work paper. Okay. So, again, uh, take note that your E1, your entry in E1 will be to credit investment uh, account for the amount of 288,000 uh, E1. Take note here. 288,000 and uh, we have uh, the amount of uh, non-controlling interest of 72,000. So the total of 360,000. That's in E1. I hope uh, you are following. So debit common stock, debit retained earnings, credit investment, and uh, we have to credit non-controlling interest. So the sum of 240 and 120, 360 should tally with 360. Then in E2, uh, we have now a uh, total of uh, uh, 318,000 uh, for the debit. No? That's in E2. 
and for the credit is uh, still the amount of uh, 318,000. Now let's try to look at the uh, entries in E2. Uh, we have debit to inventory of 6. Then uh, we have accumulated uh, depreciation of equipment uh, 96. Then accumulated depreciation of buildings for 192. We debit to land for its undervaluation 7200. And then discount on uh, bonds payable for 4800. And debit to goodwill in the amount of 12000. Now take note that the total is 318,000. Then for the credit side of uh, E2, we now have 216,000 uh, for the buildings, uh, 216,000. Then the non-controlling interest of 18,000. And finally credit to the investment in S company for 84,000. Now the total of the credit of 318,000. And uh, for E3, again we have the debit side total of E3 equal to 22,200. And the credit side total of 22,200. So, for the entry, we now debit to cost of goods sold for the undervaluation of inventory. Then we debit to depreciation spends, 6000 Then for the accumulated uh, depreciation of uh, the building being an overvaluation, 6000 We debit to interest expense. For 1,200, and we have now the goodwill impairment loss in the amount of 3,000. And uh, for the credits in uh, E3, uh, we have uh, the inventory for 6,000, then uh, we have 12,000 for uh, the accumulated depreciation of the equipment then credit to discount on bonds payable 1200 and finally credit to goodwill for its impairment loss now the total is still 22200 that's for uh, e3 then uh, your e4 is uh, just to debit investment income. So for E4, you have the balance of investment uh, income of 34, 440. You can find this in the T account. Then we have to debit non controlling interest 7,200 and the dividends paid by S in the amount of 36,000 uh, and finally credit to investment for 5,640 which uh, total is 41,640 now you can find this uh, balances like 5,640 we can find that in the the accounts uh, as posted above and finally uh, we have the uh, amount of uh, the final closing uh, entry that's now your uh, e5 and that in e5 uh, here uh, which uh, we have the uh, final closing uh, entry to uh, record non-controlling interest in net income of subsidiary and credit non-controlling interest. 
no make sure that in your work paper you should merely follow the debits and the credits in requirement number five the same with the numberings and take note that your debit should tally with your credits and that your totals no should tally now you'll not find difficulty in this as long as your requirement number five the entries are correct okay so we have now the uh, i have uh, shown to you the main differences between the cost model and the equity model and it's uh, in terms of uh, recording dividends uh, paid by the subsidiary it's in terms of recording uh, the net income of the subsidiary to be recorded by the parent and uh, even in terms of recording the goodwill impairment loss and the uh, allocated excess which should be debited to investment income now this uh, main differences uh, between the cost model and the equity model you can refer back again to requirement numbers three four five and six okay so we have uh, similar uh, amounts to be shown in uh, the initial entries however when you already uh, record the share in dividends investment income and the amortization of allocated excess that's when you have to touch on the investment account okay so i hope you already have this i have already shared screen i have uh, uh, focused on the main differences between the cost model and the equity model so take note of these main differences now requirement number six uh, this is for the year 20x5 and as well as the entries I have already indicated what are the correct pairs in the entries. Make sure that you have the correct numbers to be posted. Now that is uh, the equity method in contrast with the uh, the cost uh, model or the cost method of recording the investment account now the rest of the other items are uh, already uh, uh, similar to that of uh, the cost model i have emphasized uh, so far uh, what are the main differences between the cost model and uh, the equity model when it comes to recording in the investment account okay so i hope i have uh, shared screen uh, with you uh, everything including all the requirements just take note of the main differences between the cost model and the equity uh, model when it comes to uh, recording and closing the investment in S company stock. And at the same time, uh, closing it to investment income or loss from investment. Now, the rest of the other requirements are merely repetition. Uh, whatever you find in requirement number one most of these are also found in uh, I mean in uh, problem one most of these are also found in uh, problem number two only that problem number two is uh, focusing on the equity model in contrast to 
the cost model for okay so uh, that's uh, problem number two and uh, I'm going to continue now with the uh, problem uh, this quite uh, a very long problem also uh, we have the uh, cost model method against the equity method so we have now uh, problem number three okay let me share screen uh, with you problem number three that's still about the uh, cost model and uh, the equity model uh, in other words uh, this uh, additional problem will guide you on the main difference between the cost uh, model and the equity model now we have the uh, requirements here for uh, okay i hope you are trying to follow now i am uh, referring to requirements of uh, problem number three okay uh, requirements of uh, problem number three including determination of goodwill for uh, requirement uh, here we have up to requirements number five so uh, i will just uh, share screen this with you so i can still go to uh, more problems uh, straight uh, problems aside from the cost model and the equity model at least you have uh, already uh, examples of uh, the cost model and the equity uh, model so the last requirement here is the reconciliation okay so uh, next i am going to discuss uh, cost model equity model are uh, the same lang ang uh, uh, methods for the cost model and uh, the equity model but i'm going to continue now with problem uh, eight so at least uh, you will have uh, an example which is already uh, different from the other problems and uh, of course I am going to take a uh, problem 11 so by uh, tomorrow uh, the focus will be on the multiple choice uh, problems so I hope uh, you will uh, continue opening the YouTube uh, tomorrow I may uh, lecture I will lecture uh, anytime but uh, for sure you can have it uh, uh, in the evening for the solution to the multiple choice problems okay we now go to uh, problem uh, 8 uh, the consolidation or the recognition of uh, subsidiary so we have now uh, problem number eight and then problem uh, number 11 which is the computation of uh, consolidated balances the computation of the consolidated balances okay so we have uh, Problem uh, 8 is uh, about uh, the consolidation, the consolidation, and uh, as well as uh, the recognition of uh, subsidiary. So, uh, we will uh, continue with uh, this as uh, 
a different problem from uh, the previous uh, examples. So my purpose here is for you to have a uh, another uh, problem which is uh, not uh, similar with the other problems that uh, we are discussing. So we have uh, problem uh, number eight. Okay, so we are just in problem five. So from, uh, for problem eight, the consolidation or the recognition of subsidiary. Uh, the corporation owns an 85% interest in Saab Corporation. On December 31, 20X4, in the Ports Consolidated Financial uh, Statements, the carrying value of Saab's net assets is 1.2 million. And the carrying value of the non-controlling interest in Saab, including the non-controlling interest share of accumulated other comprehensive income is 120,000. In January 1, 20X5, Ports Corporation decided to sell a 50% interest in Saab to a third party in exchange for cash of 720,000. As a result of this transaction, Ports loses control of subsidiary but retains a 35% interest in the former subsidiary valued at 420000 on that date. Now, it's only uh, 35% because the original uh, holding was uh, 85%. However, it sold 50% of its interest in Saab, so meaning uh, the uh, retained interest only 35%. So we have now uh, a ports or P gain on sale of subsidiary stock is computed as follows. So we have now the cash uh, proceeds in the amount of uh, 720,000 and the fair value of retained non-controlling interest equity is uh, 35% uh, valued at 420,000. The carrying value of the non-controlling interest before consolidation a 15% or prior outside non-controlling interest. Now, 15%, it's 15% uh, of 100% uh, uh, minus 85%. Uh, now, initially, uh, the net assets is uh, 1.2 million. However, it stated that the uh, non-controlling interest is 120,000. Now, all the figures are given. So, we have now the total of 1,260,000. The carrying value of the net assets of the subsidiary is only 1.2 million. So, the gain on uh, disposal or the consolidation is 60,000. Okay, so that's now the requirement. Did determine any gain or loss on disposal or the consolidation. Next, we go to uh, problem 9. Sale of subsidiary not resulting in loss of control. Deletion. No additional shares issued. Palmer Company owns 96,000 uh, shares of Stevens Corporation's 120,000 uh, outstanding shares. So that means that the shares own is only 96 of the total 120. So it means uh, 
only 80% of uh, the interest of the subsidiary. The December 31, 2004 consolidated balance sheet presented by Palmer and Stevens included net assets of Stevens in the amount of 720000 In January 1, 2005, Palmer sells 12,000 shares, that's 10% uh, of the outstanding common on its sorry, uh, stock. Okay, so Steven uh, Palmer now is the uh, controlling or the parent on its uh, Steven stock for uh, two unrelated parties for 84,000. So that's a mean any gain or loss on dilution. So for problem number nine, P companies additional paid in capital arising from sale of subsidiary shares. So we have now the cash uh, proceeds given at 84,000. Then we have the carrying value of the non-controlling interest, 720,000 multiplied by 10%. So it's 72,000. The gain, a transfer within equity in additional paid in capital. So the 720,000 is already the gross up amount since it's the amount presented in the consolidated balance sheet because P company continues to have the ability to control S company the sale of S shares is treated as an equity transaction therefore no gain or loss is recognized instead Palmer company's additional paid in capital increases by 60,000. So that's for the additional uh, paid in uh, capital for the amount of 60,000. Okay, so we have now uh, number 10. Let's take up uh, number 10 before we uh, finally go to number 11, the last uh, problem. Sale of subsidiary not resulting in loss of control dilution with additional shares. But this company owns 96,000 of the 120,000 outstanding common shares acquired at uh, book value. The December 31, uh, 20 X4 consolidated. Uh, Balance sheet presented by Patis and uh, Salt included net assets of Salt in the amount of 720,000. In January 1, 2005, Salt issues 30,000 additional shares of common stock to unrelated parties for 210,000. So in uh, problem 10, P's additional paid in capital arising from sale of subsidiary shares. So we have now the cash proceeds from issuance of uh, additional uh, shares for 210,000 uh, given. Then we have the carrying value of the non-controlling from issuance of additional shares, the non-controlling interest priority issuance of uh, additional shares. So we have now the book value of 720,000. We multiply by the non-controlling interest equal to 20%. The controlling interest is uh, 80% because of 96 over 120. So it's 80 so the non-controlling interest is uh, 20%. And you multiply it by the book value of 720,000. 
So we get the book value of the shareholders equity of 144,000. Uh, that's the non-controlling interest. Non-controlling interest after the issuance of additional shares, the original book value before issuance, and then we have the additional issuance of 210,000. Then we have now the uh, book value of shareholders' equity after the issuance is 930,000. Now we have uh, 36 uh, percent, that's the adjusted uh, share of the non controlling interest. So the gain transfer within equity in additional paid in capital account. Uh, we have now the 20% ownership before additional issuance of shares. Now we are adding 120,000 plus 30, a uh, 124 plus 30 divided by 120 plus 30. Uh, so we have now the uh, ownership after additional uh, issuance. P company recognizes an increase in its investment in S from 576,000, that's 80%, to uh, 595, 200, 930,000, uh, uh, that's the adjusted stockholders equity. Uh, we multiply by 96 uh, over 150 shares. So the ownership here, uh, we have uh, 96 over 150. So meaning you have an interest equal to 64% and you multiply it by 930,000. That gives 595,200 uh, and uh, we now have the additional uh, paid in capital of 19,200 comparing 595,200 and uh, we have 576,000 so still we have 19,200. As stated, on January 1, SALT issues 30,000 additional shares. So, the additional uh, shares uh, issued by uh, SALT is uh, now equal to uh, 30,000 shares. Whereas, the original shares totaled 120,000. So it makes a total of uh, 150,000 shares. Now of 150,000 shares, the ownership after the issuance is uh, 36%. So it means uh, 24,000 shares. Uh, that's the difference between 120,000 uh, and 96,000. So we divide it by 120,000 outstanding shares. You have 20% ownership. While in the second computation, that's 24,000, not 124. 24,000 uh, the difference between 120 and 96 so you have only 24,000 shares plus 30,000 shares so that makes 54,000 shares divided by 150 so it's an interest of 36 percent. Next, we go to number 11. Uh, number 11 is uh, 
computation of uh, consolidated uh, balances. On January 1, 2004, PS Corporation acquired 80% of the 100,000 outstanding voting shares of SR in exchange for 31.25 per share cash. The remaining 20% of SR shares continued trade for 30, 30 both before and after PS acquisition. In January 1, 2004, SR's book and fair values were as follows. So, SR here is the acquired company. The acquiring is PS. Now, we have the uh, book values and the fair values of the assets and the liabilities of uh, the acquired company. In addition, PS assigned a 600,000 value to certain unpatented technologies recently developed by SR. These technologies were estimated to have a three-year remaining life. During 20X4, SR paid a 30,000 dividend to its shareholders. The companies reported the following revenues and expenses from their separate operations for the year ending December 31, 20X4. We have now the revenues and the expenses. OPS and SR. That's for the year 20X4. However, the uh, investment date was January 1, 20X4. Questions uh, now from numbers 1 to uh, 7. Uh, question number 1, 7. 1. What total value should be assigned to its SR? acquisition in its January 1, 2004 consolidated balance sheet. So we have now uh, uh, here the business combinations are recorded generally at the fair value of the consideration transferred by the acquiring firm plus the acquisition date fair value of the non-controlling interest. PS consideration transferred is 31.25 uh, multiplied by 80,000 shares. So 2.5 million and the non-controlling interest with the uh, fair value of 30 multiplied by 20,000 shares. So for total Fair value of SR in January 1, 20X4 uh, for 3.1 million. So, in question number one, what total value should be assigned to its SR acquisition? So, each identifiable asset acquired and liability assumed in a business combination should initially be reported at its uh, acquisition date fair value. So in other words, we have to uh, recognize the fair values of these assets and liabilities for the total value uh, should uh, that should be assigned by PS to its uh, SR acquisition. Now, requirement 2. What valuation principle should PS uh, use to report each of SR's identifiable assets and liabilities in its January 1, 2004 consolidated balance sheet? So, what valuation principle should PS uh, use? Here, in number 2. In period subsequent to uh, acquisition, the subsidiaries' assets and liabilities 
are reported at their acquisition date, fair values, adjusted for amortization and depreciation. Except for certain financial items, they are not continually adjusted for changing fair values. Requirement 3. For years subsequent to acquisition, how will SRs, identifiable assets, and liabilities be valued in the consolidated reports? So we have now uh, SRs, total fair value of uh, 3.1 million as computed above. And we have to deduct the uh, net uh, book value, so net assets uh, book value of 1,290,000 uh, uh, 1,290,000 that's using the book value so we have here the uh, book value of 2,970,000 uh, and we did that the liabilities of uh, 1 million uh, 680,000. Now we have a difference equal to 1 million 290,000. That's the book value of the net assets. So the excess of the uh, fair value over the book value is 1 million. 810,000. Then we have the adjustments from book to fair values for buildings and equipment. We have the amount of 250,000. Then for trademarks, for uh, build uh, trademarks equals 200,000. Patent technology for one million uh, sixty thousand then unpatented technology uh, which was given in the additional information so we have now the adjustments to fair values in other words we have the goodwill in the amount of two hundred thousand so in number three uh, we have to report goodwill for 300,000. For how much goodwill resulted from PS uh, acquisition of uh, SR? So we have now the uh, amount of the combined revenues of uh, 4,400,000 and we have the combined uh, expenses for uh, here 600,000 uh, thousand no for total of two million three hundred fifty thousand then we have the buildings and equipment excess uh, depreciation that's two hundred fifty thousand divided by five years so we have fifty thousand then for uh, trademark excess uh, amortization uh, considering the trademark has uh, an undervaluation, so we now have uh, 200,000 divided by 10 years or 20,000. Then patented uh, technology amortization uh, for the amount of uh, 1,060,000 divided by 4, so that's equal to uh, 1 million 60 divided by 4 or 265,000 and the unpatented technology amortization initially the amount is 600,000 and the remaining life is 3 years so we have 200,000 so the consolidated net income of 1,615,000 so that's the uh, consolidated income and what amounts are located to the controlling non-controlling 
uh, interest. So, uh, actually, we have uh, goodwill. That's the answer to number four. And the answer to uh, number five is uh, the consolidated uh, net income. Okay. And what amounts are allocated. So, this number four is uh, already number five. So, SR's uh, revenue minus the expenses. Then, we have the total excess uh, amortization above. So, if you are going to add the negative items and deduct uh, the positive, okay, so we now get the net amount of 435000 so, the adjusted income is 365,000. Multiply it by 20%. So, for the non-controlling interest, before a share of consolidated income, and we have now the consolidated income, the controlling interest share of consolidated income. Uh, we have the amount of 1 million. 542,000. Now, the answer to uh, what is the non controlling interest amount to be reported in the December 31, uh, 20x4 consolidated balance sheet? Okay, so we have now the uh, non controlling interest, and uh, in number 7. And assuming instead that based on its share prices, SR January 1, 2004, total fair value was uh, assessed at 2250000 How would the recorded amounts of SR's assets change on ES acquisition date consolidated? balance sheet so we have now the uh, bargain purchase uh, actually with this requirement uh, number seven so you change the numbering the acquisition method requires that the subsidiaries assets acquired and liabilities as shown be recognized at their acquisition date fair values regardless of the assessed fair value. Therefore, none of SRs identifiable assets and liabilities would change as a result of the assessed fair value. When a bargain purchase occurs, however, no goodwill is recognized. Uh, let's end our discussion. Number Kwanja. Now I will uh, just uh, share screen the solution to problem 12. Problem 12, I hope this uh, will help you. Okay, a uh, problem 12. Okay, problem 12, uh, the fact that a uh, uh, problem 12, 12, Okay, share screen, ha? Huh? I will just share screen. The solution to uh, problem 12. 12 is uh, about computation of uh, consolidated uh, balances. So, here yeah, we have now several... Uh, Accounts to be uh, computed under the full goodwill. So we have now uh, 
the acquiring company and the uh, RR. We have now the uh, requirements for a consolidation prepared on December 31, 2004. What balances would be reported for the following? So we have now for amounts to be reported for uh, expenses and the rest of these accounts. So we have now the uh, amounts to be reported for expenses, uh, dividends paid, up to retained earnings. Okay, so that ends our discussions. For tomorrow, I'm going to lecture on the multiple choice uh, problems. Okay, so please open your YouTube again. I'm very